the soul of the species shall pull you out of the humanized darkness. Hello everyone, welcome to tonight's episode. I wanted to speak about uh, an interesting idea that occurred to me. <clears throat> that human beings are trying to solve their problems individually. And when you think about individual problem solving, it's imaginable, it's conceivable. But when you think about collective problem solving, due to the nature of the person, Because we care for individuals more than collectives, individuals are thriving. Individuals are uh, prioritized. We start off as a individual human being. The individual finds its mind divided between duality. The mind is divided by duality between duality because of the nature of the cosmos and the absence of light. <coughs> And everyday creatures on this earth and our ancestors saw life and then didn't, saw life and then didn't, saw life and then didn't. And this, I feel, led to the value system of the individual arising. That means it was as if, like, <clears throat> death is kind of like the darkness of, uh, you know, non-existence. Life is like... Or death is like the darkness of existence and life is like the light of experience. As individuals in duality, our lives are divided between objects and subjects. Physically, we can notice an individual as an object subjectively subjectively we can notice an individual <clears throat> but when it comes to physically collectively we cannot we can subjectively say the idea of humanity yes as if we look at the axis of individuals and collectives that means what options are there you either are an individual you're either a collective or you are space the void three avenues of states of mind possible Now, individuals <clears throat> cannot, per se, if we divide the psychology of the human being between an inner realm and an outer realm, and the outer realm being uh, what the uh, attention of the moment sees in front of it as an object and a subject, if the problem is from how you're looking at it, a collective can never help in a strange way. Not never help, and that's an intense statement, but <clears throat> when one is individual, it's like the world is in them. When one is collective, it's like they're in the world. And anytime a person forgets that they're in a world, their inner realm can, in some sense, <clears throat> become heavier or prioritized. Now, the idea of the soul of the species pulling the human, the individual human being out of dehumanized darkness, I thought about, we look at an individual and <clears throat> when an individual can't solve its problems, let's say it goes to another individual. That means either, I mean, <clears throat> let me see, what's the geometry of this? An individual can either, let's say an individual has a problem, 
and let's say that problem is some sort of darkness, okay? The individual can solve the problem through the self. <clears throat> the individual can have uh, solve the problem through the help of others. The individual can solve the problem without the help of itself, without the help of others, as if something you just see, like a think, think of its Jungian synchronicity, or a bird flew by, or Albert Einstein, <clears throat> he was wondering about this relationship of space and time, and he was literally at a train station, and he saw a train, and he wondered if there was someone inside it, and that person had seen two lightning strikes, do you know? How would it appear? What I mean by that is that the world or even culture helped solve. That means without trains, we have no clue if we would have ever found E equals MC squared. That means the, the, uh, <clears throat> so many things lead to so many things. So, let's say somebody is in a situation where they can't help themselves and others can't see their inner realm, so others can't help them, and they're left with the world, and let's say the unknown world, and if the person's religious, they're praying, or if the person is non-religious, they're planning. And I thought... Well, instead of individuals helping themselves, instead of others helping individuals, we just have the honor of civilization leading to the restoration of the individual psychology. <clears throat> if a person sees what, what a majority of their problems are, I think all problems in this life is that we're here temporarily and it's all about the opportunity cost of how our energy, uh, what our energy finds while, while it's alive. You know, it's like writing something and looking at your own handwriting and then fathoming how many different types of handwriting are there on the planet. <clears throat> so many different types and there's so many different types of individuals. That means when you look at people's handwriting, you can just see a kind of fragment of their mind, of the uniqueness of their mind. I think, I don't know if I'm at that point yet, but I think I can tell when I see handwriting from where the person held the pen. <clears throat> if they held the pen from the middle of the pen or um, from the closer to its edge. But anyways, the whole point is that the collective system <clears throat> becomes the backup system of the individual rather than the individual being the backup system of the collective. And we have to serve the advanced civilization then become, in some sense, as the old saying goes, masters of it. You must serve before you command. <clears throat> what that means is uh, the person, let's say you want to run a company, you got to know all levels of that company. You know, there's a difference between a king that used to be a peasant and a king that never knows what the beyond the walls of the kingdom are like. <clears throat> the king that in some sense can walk with the peasants. I remember I, I, I said this story, imagine there was this prince and there were three princes this is the oldest one and the other are very young and because this is the oldest prince this prince sees that his father the king has an ego and because the father has an ego there's many things he doesn't see that's the dangers of having a big ego you do become heavy you become like a samurai but at the same time like heavy armor <clears throat> but 
<coughs> your mobility becomes less. That means if it if there was lava coming, a ninja would survive better than a samurai. If the ninja and the samurai, if a ninja was caught in front of the samurai, like the samurai would win. If it was like hailing, like you know, it was a hell storm, the samurai would definitely have the upper hand. Anyways, this oldest prince, <coughs> he sees the king, and before the kingdom wakes up, just before the king wakes up and the royal um, <coughs> events and ceremonies of the day take place, this prince would always go, wake up in the morning and go and check the kingdom, and would also go and talk to one of the palace guards that was a kid forced to play soccer with them. That means imagine like <clears throat> the king's child needs friends. <laughs> and so <clears throat> one of those friends had become like friends with the prince. And so the prince would dress like a casual man and go. And so on his way to go see his friend in the morning, the palace guard, this prince, a beggar comes up to him. And the beggar is like, is in a fine condition and says to the person, says to this prince, give me something, give me. You know, that means give, that means some people in some sense want before giving and some people give before wanting, you know, there's a difference. And the prince looks at the man and he says, if I give you, would you know the value of it? And in some sense, the king, <coughs> prince, um, I don't remember exactly how the story goes, but let's say the prince gives the beggar something, but he also gives him words. And anyways, the prince goes. The prince goes and he finds himself by the with the palace guard kind of drinking tea in the morning, like talking like friends, <clears throat> like from, you know, ch since childhood or whatever. But suddenly there's a yogi approaching, there's a mystic approaching and sadhus in some sense imagine like their clothing was just a garb, they were like simple beings. In the outer realms are very simple and the inner realms incredibly complex. And you know guys, to be honest, I, I didn't paint the story properly because I remember there was um different and <clears throat> anyways. The, I'll continue. The prince is there with the palace guard dressed in normal clothing so nobody can tell if he's the prince. And there's this sage just walking just towards the front of the palace where the palace guard is <coughs> and the princess. And so the palace guard immediately goes on his guard and he goes ahead uh, in front of the prince. And this man is approaching, this mystic, this yogi approaches. And the yogi looks at the prince and says, I am here to save you, prince, you know. <clears throat> and the prince is in some sense shocked and he says, you saved me, I'm a prince, look at my kingdom. In other words, he's, he's saying that it's as if um, the ego is... Man, the story's <clears throat> slipping through my fingers. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> the prince is there with the palace guard. This yogi comes. The yogi says, I want to save you, you know, and the king, who, uh, the prince, uh, future king, in some sense, he had spoken to the beggar and he felt the beggar didn't know the value and he felt that he felt this yogi also doesn't know the value, right? And he says, I am the, the future king. You're here to save me. <clears throat> and that's where suddenly the yogi says the most incredible sentence. He says, I am here to save you from you. That's the whole point of the story. That's why I shared the story. 
He says, I am here to save you from you. I feel in the future and the best thing all the human beings that are alive can do is build such an advanced civilization that all mistakes are rec recycled and efficient mistakes are recycled into efficiency. I feel uh, there's 8 billion people on the planet <clears throat> and aside from the common sense angle that of course obviously there isn't enough resources. Right? But it's not just resources a human being needs. You know, it's as if, like, why does a human being survive? You know, it's we're saying to continue. But then we say, why does the human being want to continue? And we're like, so something remains in the universe. But then we say, why? And so a, a dimension to our purpose as creatures is the exploration of sight. <clears throat> And the other is continuity in order to explore. That means if we are not explorers, the universe makes no sense. And that's the issue of the educational system. It's making students rather than explorers. It's just, it's just so hard to watch. You know how many trees have been sacrificed for nothing just so children can see a letter, you know, from the subjective angle of the teacher's acceptance of the content. You know, <clears throat> that means the educational system is literally, it was, it's, it's kind of like, it's, it's more fit for the military than it's fit for a, a global educational system. You know, a sort of a idea, I mean, kids sitting in school looking at a chalkboard, how boring, how boring, there should be tables, there should be designs, you know, there should be giant problems every human being is solving, the classrooms of all schools should be, should have a day where they, they're in some sense connected, <clears throat> do you know? I see the educational system in the future just becoming challenging global problems. That means the parents ask this kid, uh, the kid comes home from school and the parents are like, what did you learn today? You know, and the kid's going to be like, <clears throat> we, um, um, today the classroom looked at the issue of, uh, let's say world hunger and everybody in the classroom was in some sense, uh, the teacher gave a performance and everybody was inspired to in some sense see if they can uh, uh, find a problem using their human dimension, right? Every every human being right now has a value <clears throat> and this value may not be understood for a long time, which means probably for the next hundred years, there has to be many humble, uh, strong, silent beings just enduring, not expecting instant victory, but just going through the battles of everyday life consciously. Right? And maintaining a decency resonance. That decency resonance means that it's sometimes when things happen in the outer realm that are turbulent, you don't fight it. Because anything you fight, you get contaminated by its karma. <clears throat> As Ernest Hemingway uh, or Mark Twain, I think it was Mark Twain, he says, uh, don't wrestle with a pig, you'll get muddy. And I feel sometimes when one enters a sort of energetic state where there is intense resistance, they can't ignore how anything you do becomes a memory for yourself. That means if people really cared for their future self, they would also care for the type of uh, <coughs> um, contribution to life they're leaving behind. I feel that... Uh, Humanity has so many dimensions, and we are 8 billion individual dimensions of humanity wondering how it's going to integrate. Eventually in the future there will come a day where it will be global unity. That day of global unity, I don't know when it will come, <clears throat> but I, I, I will tell you it is definitely past the geometrical renaissance and the cyberspace renaissance. It's after these. I don't know after, um, it, it, I feel it's going to be after because you see, um, if we for a second feel that it's not human beings here and there's an intelligent activity taking place, that means <clears throat> the universe is painting on the earth civilizations.
we fear ourselves. We fear our solitude. <clears throat> we fear our collectivity. We fear everything. Is there any? Is there something in this existence that the species doesn't fear? You know, it's as if you know what it is. It's as if everything that a person fears reach goes eventually inevitably towards nothing or emptiness. So if the person finds something in this life that allows them to stop fearing emptiness, they stop fearing fear. The greatest riddle of the living universe. What should we do while we can do anything? Okay, let's let's. I'm going to start from thinking about the different types of darkness. So I've established that <clears throat> there is a self to self relationship. <clears throat> this is a, a one's communication with their own intelligence. There is self to other communication. <clears throat> this is one's communication with that which is outside of them. And then there is the communication of self with the world. And I'm just going to add one more. Let's say there's a communication with self and the void. These are important. <clears throat> First of all, self to self communication. That's another way of saying oneness, Advaita. And non-dualism applies, but there's three states for non-dualism. That means there's three non-dualistic states. There is three non-one uh, states, for example. So self-to-self -self communication is, aside from oneness, there was also the, the word presence and true nature. <clears throat> this is very important, and I'm glad that the New Age community is on this. Now we have self to other. Self to other, this is where psychology, I would say, has come. Because when it comes to psychology's ability to explain self to self communication, it's as abstract as the edge of the sky. <clears throat> but when it comes to self and others, there is enough content to make um, a reason, uh, reason able judgment. A reason, if we're able to make, uh, to see reason. And self to other means duality. So there was a singular view. Now we are going to the dual. And this is where I shouldn't honestly say too much because I have been more active in my inner realms than my outer realms, at least after a certain period in this life. <clears throat> so when it comes to self and other, I can say This is in, in regards to culture, society, this is all fits into, <clears throat> let's say culture, let me, society would go more into the world, but, but let's say, okay, society, culture, pretty much it's just psychology of relationship of self with other senses of self outside of its own self. Then self to world. This is where I would say all those people who see miracles, for example, that's a self to world communication or a world to self communication. <clears throat> let's say somebody, <clears throat> let's say um, Storm from the X-Men, she controlled the weather, you know, that's self to world communication. <laughs> self to world means 
um, there is the opportunity for collective experience. That means it is only in this dimension where human beings can wear the same jersey and run after a soccer ball, you know. Then the communication of self to the void. And this is something where my first answer is only silence will teach you this. There's something, some teachings that go beyond the language threshold. So once the person trusts their outer realms, they will notice that they also have nothing to lose in trusting their inner realms. <clears throat> that means think of it when you trust or distrust. Technically, you, you don't know what's going to happen. You know, trust is another word for like <clears throat> um, <clears throat> acceptance or... Or to stay in the rhythm. Just like a musician trusts a beat, human beings can trust themselves, they can trust others, they can trust their world, and you can also trust the void. But the void has a special thing. The thing about the void is that just because you don't exist to a self, that means think as if this life is a branch, is a leaf on a branch. So imagine truth is a branch and this is a leaf. <coughs> You know, or you, your true self is like a branch and there's many leaves connected. That means people don't realize how many versions of, of the self are existing. That means it, it's this strange thing where, I don't know if anyone has ever said something like this, but I feel we are leaving behind a spiraling trail of endless selfhood. That means what happens to a memory? We may forget a memory, but does the world? And if electrons could speak, what would they say? They'd probably say, you're going the wrong way. Nature is an opportunity to always experience more than ourselves. Every moment of our life, everything we seek, all those people who <clears throat> have, have, have cared to step into some and trusted some moment simply enough to enter the unknown. I feel if every human being can master, they can train to accept the, their most foolish self. That means if they are comfortable not being a fool in front of themselves, not being a fool to others, not being a fool in front of the world, but being a fool to all that is fathomable. <clears throat> that is a different level. That is literally like... Uh, that is where your heart is being tested. You know, some moments your heart gets tested, some moments your brain gets tested, you know, your mind. <clears throat> you know, forgiveness is like a test of the heart. Usually when a person can forgive, you know, they should see it. Oh my God, has a random opportunity happened where I can forgive someone? You know, <laughs> can you imagine somebody who was obsessed with forgiveness? The person's like, I am forgiving myself for forgiving so much that I'm forgiving you. <laughs> and ultimately, it's just, there is something intelligent here. I'm, I'm sure people won't disagree with that. Now, what kind of intelligence is, is the debate. And, and from the genetical angle, it's not, free will is nullified. <clears throat> and from the from the objective angle, from the subjective angle, in the mental arena, it cannot. Free will is God in its own room behind the eyes of man uh, before man moves in front of his eyes. I 
I feel everybody who has an ability to be cruel, the reason is, is because they are, they feel like a king in their inner realms. That means the inner realms, one must... Just like a person can raise their hand into the air diagonally instantly and point at the sky, the person should instantly have an ability to command their inner realms because the inner realms are waiting to be used. We have built such a material life, we have not actually prepared a proper civilization for subjects you know, after worshipping objects, we went to subject worship, you know. Now, from subject worship, we're trying to go into experience worship, but we're going to realize you can't worship experience because it is a journey. A dynamic journey cannot be made into a static concept or truth. It's like the enlightened being, suddenly someone came and asked them, what is truth? And the enlightened being is like, did you say what is truth? It's like, buddy, drop the bone. <laughs> you know? We chase frisbees that the void throws. And the barks of dogma are heard, you know. You know, it's one of the great tragedies of this world. <clears throat> Ideas have possessed people's behavior to become blind to life sensitivity. That means it's as if after some point All memories are not like a linear line, guys. This is what we have been uh, mistaken. Because we have thought time is linear, we think of memory is like a file cabinet or A to B to C to D. But I'll tell you, it's a, it's a circle. <clears throat> memory is like a circle. Memory has an orbit. And it's as if it's a circle and the center of the dot is the here and now. And from this here and now, you need two radius, two lines, and then you have a certain degree of perception. <coughs> that means a person needs two memories and then between those two memories, you can create endless reality. That means, I would say, all of reality can be put into these three numbers, 0, 1, 2. This is human knowledge so far. The void, all that is in it, and how all that is, is divided between chaos and order, or light and darkness.
Okay. So, self to self communication, self to other communication, self to world communication, self to void communication. <clears throat> the self is the individual <coughs> and um, uh, and so pretty much, I guess, when I'm, when I'm trying the picture that's been painted so far, what I'm trying to paint here, let's say, is that if you can't help yourself, <clears throat> then others have to help you. If others can't help you, then your world has to help you. If the world can't help you, the void has to help you. And when the void helps you, you're not here anymore. So, there's, there's a complexity there with the self to void, I will dedicate an episode to this, but really what it is, is um, when in Rome, be, Ro be Roman, when in the void, be void. That's the only way you can communicate with the void. It's not for the living or the animate. I shouldn't say living because that's kind of like, <clears throat> <you know? laughs> it's not like a movie, but I'll say like, uh, beyond the animate, there is knowing. But that knowing surpasses and becomes unconditional. So what that means is right now human beings don't realize our minds are like a field. Literally it's a field. And this antenna is like literally our, imagine um, there was a swim, imagine you entered the, um, <clears throat> um, you went to see the swimming pool of an apartment, okay, an apartment complex. And before purchasing the apartment, let's say, and you went to see the swimming pool and you suddenly saw the swimming pool was on the ceiling and the water of the swimming pool wasn't like gravity wasn't throwing it down. <clears throat> and the person's like, uh, excuse me, sir, you know, it's like, why, why is the swimming pool on the ceiling, you know? <clears throat> and the real estate agent imagine says, oh yeah, they have anti-gravity technology here, you know, so you can uh, literally go swim in the, on the ceiling, you know? <laughs> I don't know, something, you know, there's some. <clears throat> but the idea is, imagine now on that swimming pool on the ceiling, you hovered from the ground with the anti-gravity technology and your head went into the swimming, and you had swimming goggles and you were wearing the snorkel thing upside down. That's it. <clears throat> and... It's literally like our brains are inside that swimming pool, which is why they are like an antenna. <clears throat> our head is in the water of another dimension. It's not under the water, it's above the water. Our head is above water. So it's as if, or I would say the analogy completely different. Our, our, our mind, our subjective self with our consciousness is how the head is above out water, but from the neck down it's under water. <clears throat> so that's like duality, right? So the body is in duality. There's a part of this moment of being that is not just in duality. And that is how the administration is happening. And they call these canals. And the imagery I could give to you is that there are not just rivers in the outer realms, there's rivers in the inner realms. And so it's like <clears throat> once a person trusts, imagine these four avenues. This is this is a true advanced communicator, I would say. Someone who, when it comes to self-to-self -self communication, they are at peace. That means they 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 figured out what the self is. Right? So they're done with themselves. Now they're seeing more than themselves. Then they see others. <clears throat> you know, think of like all the people who are family, um, have families, right? 
So then the family man is like, okay, there's more than me here. It's like the game of life now becomes occupied by the life force of other individuals as we care for them. Now, let's say the self to other communication, it's like it's like check mark there. Then self to world communication. This means if you right now teleported anywhere in the space time continuum, you would be content. If you were a Buddhist and you had, you, there was the thought that you would be reincarnating endlessly, it doesn't matter where your eyes are found. You, you get to know the invisible um, while you're visible. And don't fear this because your mind and every subject you have known, it is in that invisible room called imagination. <laughs> Sorry guys, I tried to make it uh, French somehow, but I it was a failed attempt. I think. And self to void. You start learning from your absence. <clears throat> that means it's like life is kind of like a V or like a mountain we climb or like even a bell curve. And I'm telling you, it's like when if you're young hearing me, <clears throat> it's like um, the fool's gold is a fulfilled life. And then, when the fool becomes a wise man, you start noticing the absence of everything. And it's strange. Just like how, imagine when a person reads a book, <clears throat> they care for the words, right, on the piece of paper. Right, their attention is straight on the words, what picture are they painting. But now imagine, you started to look at the spaces between the words a bit longer. A bit longer and you realize all the words all the concepts are on the empty page <clears throat> all human visual um, certainty is in the void is in a void uncertainty and what that means is till the end of time dogmas can bark but I'm telling you this is an artist's universe I feel there will be a great conceptual but hilarious battle in the future. <clears throat> this is way ahead. I see this, let's say, 150 years from now, somewhere around there. Where every ideological system will have to come on the global stage and explain why it deserves to be here. And then there would be two divisions. Those who can't let the past go and those who already have. It's as if it's as if we, when we have a sort of, for example, republic, democrat, uh, con, um, conser co conservative, liberal, you know, <laughs> when we have these, it's as if, like, the only political, it's like in the future, a time traveler is going to come and be like, okay, okay, 
let me figure this out. So you want something from the past, you want something from the future. And what this time genius time traveler does is this time traveler makes all those people who just value the future, takes them to the past to see what the past was like and takes all those people who are in the past into the future to see what it's like. You know, and then imagine suddenly all the all the uh, leading parties, all the politicians that this time traveler took to different, you know, to, to the reverse uh, time periods. The politicians are like, okay, okay, yeah, it doesn't make sense. It has to be multidimensional because we miss out. Do you know? <clears throat> or a better way I could have said the story is like, imagine all the political leaders on this planet, this time traveler mighty. This mighty, like legendary, uh, we don't even know uh, of it, but let's say from the future, this legendary time traveler comes, okay? And he, it, this time traveler, in an instant, as if he's just commanding like the Jarvis of the future, like Tony Stark, <clears throat> and suddenly all the politicians, in reality, the whole world freezes, and only the politicians are moving. And instantly, all of them are teleported to the past, future, and all the possible timelines. Just for them to see what freedom means in the void. It means everything. That means freedom literally means everything. Literally. Do you know too much freedom can dehumanize also? And to the lack of freedom, too much of it can also dehumanize. And to be a human is in some sense being conscious of these four, as if we are kind of like, these are the seasons of the mind, the moment states of mind where man, man the, the human being is just with himself and the universe. Like some moments I've had <clears throat> when my emotions have been too heavy for me to... Um, uh, maintain maintain the personality that's a sort of self to world moment you know and in in, it's like a moment where you want no one else to be there it's just you and the vastness of a world that is incomprehensible to whatever effort we have made so far you know Imagine this time traveler comes and this time traveler says Don't do it or something intense like in the movies and the people are like, okay, and the time traveler is shocked You know how easy it was Imagine you're living in a civilization and the person does something let's say cruel or something in uh, violent okay now in civilization 1.0 currently we're like punishment you know that person did something messed up something messed up has to happen we have to be, we have to be consciously give them their karma <clears throat> if you were like Vedic or from a Buddhist angle yeah. But now imagine in the future when somebody does something off, the advanced civilization, the advanced communicators of the advanced civilization will come in some sense and literally dissect the moment into dimensions to divide all the possible angles. That means it becomes a giant research project. And there is no punishment. <clears throat> there is educational restor rest restoration, though. That means um, pretty much instead of this whole good and bad judgment, there's just going to be a multi dimensional angle and different dimensions of the act will be judged rather than the whole act being judged as a certain thing with a sort of imagined point system of care for the civilization in different contexts <clears throat> right
because our behavior is the instantaneous invention of our brain. And this instantaneity is organized. We are organized spontaneity. Organizable spontaneity. <clears throat> right now, if there are human beings, let's say, who are in some sort of shadow of civilization, some darkness, whether inner or outer, if your sense of self is inactive, or how would I say it, if your individualism I am saying that if a person feels like nothing, which the World Health Organization, I read it on their website, they said 3.3% of the population, 3.2% of the population <coughs> are uh, depressed. And I'm like, okay, you know. Depends on what the population is doing, though. <laughs> <coughs> you know, young children can't get depressed because their attention instantly moves away and their memory doesn't create <coughs> a story to be reduced that can be reduced. But the view would be that you live for your world. You serve, you live for life. And that's a strategy to live for life. Live for life and you will live for life. So a life beyond the self. If, the, if, in, if in yourself you can't find inspiration, seek it in others. If in others you can't find an inspiration and you haven't found it in yourself, seek it in your world. Go on a journey. If you can't find inspiration from the world, then come to the universal platform, the philosopher's table, and wonder about what does it mean being here. And ultimately, a book is going to transform into a notebook, and the person's tears are going to become tears of joy. And for the first time, one will be consciously welcomed into a creative universe. A universe where in, 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 in the median <clears throat> between the infinite and the finite. The earth turns and all the stories in it, on it as well. the rants of the temporary. <laughs> so the idea is um, you care for, like, let's say, okay, let me, let me speak to a new age audience for a moment. Let's say that um, people are fascinated by the idea of the soul like ancient times. Like in ancient times, the person was like, I don't know, a farmer or something or a shepherd, and the person's like, what is this? Is life only this? Oh my God, you know? And then it was like, oh my God, <laughs> you know? And so the notion of the soul, the notion of there being in the interdimensional, the interdimensional was made aware of before the intellectual, before the concept of the intellect the experience of the interdimensional took place. And if it's interdimensional, it means intellect is being ma maneuvered from two rooms. <clears throat> so that means, imagine we're in a room in the outer realms, one room, that, that outer realm room is very obvious to see. But in the inner realms, let's say you're in, your foot is half, your foot is in the door. Like you don't know what's in the room, but you're in it. Do you know? And so what else is in the room of your mind, that becomes an interesting question because human beings have not reached the sophistication of uh, 
being able to categorize the interdimensional when their understanding has to be limited to the truths of one dimension. That means we have denied ourselves um, uh, um, uh, a land, uh, um, uh, we have denied ourselves map creation of our mind due to a fixed acceptance of the realm. Not realizing whatever empirical finding is brought to the global stage the global stage is made of human beings with emotions. That means it's it's hilarious how we are not like robots that can totally be rational, you know. And we're glorifying rationality, you know, not realizing that our emo it is our emotions that make us human, you know, because our rationality is limited to the known variables. It's based on what you see. I'm telling you, it's a, it's as if the person was like, oh my God, I'm communicating with like extraterrestrials in my mind. And then the person's like, wait a minute, it's just my mind. And then they reach a certain point where they realize the invisible other is the universal self. The universal self means, are you done playing with concepts and context? And are you now interested in experience? Have you noticed that the eyes looking through the window are their own road? Your eyes are your journey. And once you can honor the journey of your eyes individually, then it goes to collectively. <clears throat> then beyond the collective, this would be the most unique thing. You know what it would be like? Like this is a hilarious metaphor. But uh, and a ridiculous one, but imagine from the Kung Fu Panda movie, that turtle, what was his name, Uguay or something, like, he turned into suddenly lotus, uh, excuse me, not lotus, he turned into petals, like flower petals out of his, like, wisdom, he was so wise, like, he, he didn't die, he became nature, you know, <laughs> and so I thought about it, it's going to be a collective kind of, collective world becoming, you know, that is where we're heading. And so the soul of the species, it's in some sense, what is the animate intelligence doing here? And I've personally concluded and people, uh, I have a sword and shield in my hand, so people can feel free to challenge me on this. <laughs> But the advanced civilization I have concluded is the smartest idea, smartest thing we can do in the outer realms. I don't know what other idea can be more, better than that. Somebody tell me a better idea than an advanced civilization. The advanced civilization being defined as before our eyes close, we saw what our ultimate effort was. That means it's like it's no longer the enlightenment of individuals. It is when nations enlight get enlightened from their egos and realize it is one planet. And then, once we have global unity, that would be, you know what it would mean? When we attain global unity as a species, let me tell you what happens. In 10 years, we would do, we would have the progress of like 10,000 years. That means all the things our ancestors were too, too selfish and cruel or violent or savage to do, we would be able to do. It would be literally hive mind um, efficiency, but it is so unfathomable from where, where, I'm, where I'm speaking that it's as if like, Sometimes I feel like my memories leave me behind, you know? <laughs> Global unity means we decided to create a backup system 
That means, let's say you, you, uh, we have 8 billion human beings united. What do we do? Like, what's the next step after world peace? We gotta do something with that world peace, right? <clears throat> so the world's in pieces. We got it into world peace. <laughs> and now that it's in world peace, we gotta use that global concentration. And that global concentration has to try to make sure we remain natural in a world that is becoming technologically motivated to exist and linguistically also through the infusion of pers personality that means a person may not realize that behavior is has nothing to do with how you're a person in some sense it, it's it's not just that it is muscle memory it is it is pattern development it is fa it is movement familiarity That means a person can be dancing in their inner realms perfectly, but in the outer realms they're like falling down all over the place, not realizing what they're doing. Yeah. So, but in their inner realms there was a perfect movement. In their inner realms the movement was clear. In the out outer realms it was off. <clears throat> you know, it wasn't in sync. The inner realms and outer realms weren't in sync. Usually when they go in in sync, you know what I feel is happening? I feel the brain hemispheres are synchronizing. And in a book I wrote called The Great Work, I said that imagine your left brain hemisphere, your right brain hemisphere is a circle with an inverted triangle inside it, and the left brain hemisphere is an inverted triangle with a circle inside it. And now imagine that when the when the left hemisphere and right brain, uh, <clears throat> right hemisphere synchronize, this becomes a tunnel. It becomes an endless tunnel. And so what it means is from the trio of how consciousness centralizes itself, people don't realize consciousness is a triangle, but not a triangle with a weird story attached to it. It's a triangle in the sense of there's there's the dimension of self, there's the dimension of others, there's the dimension of world, and then there's the awareness as the whole moment of all three, which is the center. So right now, the best thing, I guess I'll take it here, that human beings can do in 2020 onwards, one, advance communication and live a life where in every moment you're getting to see not an expected version of yourself from every moment being 50% known, 50% unknown, as if you're, you're a general walking in a battlefield and your past is your, uh, your left hand man and your, your left commander, commanding officer, and your future is your, let's say, right command, commanding, right? Uh, on your right is, is your commanding officer. And so you're walking beside your past and future, imagine. You're walking with them as the present. So in every moment that's 50, 50, 50 known, 50 unknown, universal exploration remains as a healthy possibility. Therefore, the individual gain is just the first level. So level one, self-enlightenment. Good job, you finished that up. Level two, <laughs> you know, the enlightenment of others. That means self and others. And then... Then level, you finish level two, yay, everybody's enlightened, you know. And level three, the enlightenment of the world. That means, you know what that means? That means, that means, okay, this is from a mystical context. From an esoteric context, but right now, we are being a self in a world. Then we're going to be the world in the self. And what that means is we self-enlightenment, we evolved into collective enlightenment. Then from collective enlightenment, from individual, it's as if the beehive became the planet, you know. <clears throat> So from collective enlightenment, we go to world enlightenment, and this means we stop, in, it's as if we, the attention matures to a point where it stops being 
a, 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 a self which is a little part of the earth it has the responsibility to be the whole planet this was by certain scholars referred to as the Gaian mind G-A-I A-N You know, in legends they would say Mother Earth and Father Sky, as if we are the children. The self-orphaned children. <clears throat> of a limited Earth and a limitless sky. We are the children of the infinite and the finite. We are the echo of two worlds. We are the wielding point as if two dimensions intersected. We are the intersection point. One may have honor for themselves, but they will realize they're temporary. Eventually, they will care for honor in a collective sphere. That honor in the collective sphere needs a new story. <clears throat> and the new story has to come from legends being born. And for the first time, it's important to be, uh, to live in such a way that we become the mythology of our of the future generations that means aim for the mythic now is the time now now where minds are activating where human beings are noticing they're more than subjects and we are from the linguistic from the long linguistic slumber we're awakening you know, giants, it's as if giant presences of nature, they are remembered, you know. <clears throat> we are giants. It's just that we've zoomed out. <laughs> and honestly, every talk I give, like I, it, it's following the context of what do we do with energy? Like seriously, what do we do with? <laughs> we have to direct it, right? We it's like that means um, when we were an uh, animal in a forest that we had no name or self awareness in the in the sophisticated level that we have now, right? It was as if there was no purpose. That was life's purpose was to I don't know find some food without realizing it. Like that was life's purpose back in the day. <laughs> but we who realize, we, we who have a self, we're aware of that self, that means we ultimately can control the velocity. Which means you can aim your intelligence, you can direct it, give it a direction, or you can just uh, control its speed. So, uh, so humility is, for example, helping with the speed of the moment's calm.
So what does that mean? That means the purpose of life is that you can't really control the content of the mind. So whatever moment you're in, just aim and literally drive your mind. Drive your intelligence. We are drivers of intelligence. That means we're intelligent when we animate. If we don't move, it's like we're like as much as a statue. It's like the person who was like lived like a statue his whole life. It's their biography was like, yeah, the person occupied a moment in space and time. Yay. You know, end of biography, you know? Like <laughs> it's as if we have to all be uh, conquerors of our inner realms and servants of the outer realms. I feel that's that would stabilize human psychology where in front of your eyes you're here to serve the world. It's like the moment you open your eyes, think of this as the tribe of consciousness. You have in you have entered the spirit of civilization. It is no joke. It's here. <clears throat> and human voices are now finding a way to extend library. Uh, shelves, you know, beyond this dimension. The logos through I, um, the logos one night through um, the pen in my hand told me that every human being has a library behind their eyes and it's up to them to share. That means your eyes are a unique artwork that if you feel you deserve to see this artwork then you will understand why civilization is. You know, nobody knows. The internet has come out of nowhere. The internet is allowing globalization. What that means is personalities for the first time are entering a global sphere, right? And that means right now we have to become conscious of the content we even make in cyberspace. You know why? That means people may feel, yeah, put whatever you want on the internet, but we don't realize in the future our mind might end become this, might enter this, right? So the consciousness is required, right? This is why I was like, oh my god, we have too many movies of like killing robots, like I had in my science fiction, uh, the human beings and their relationship with robots is so elevated and so enlightened. Robots are like, they are like the... They're living in humanity's footsteps, kind of. Because our communication sets the tone of the world. If truth has to be an object, it can't be truth. If truth has to be a subject, it can't be truth. If truth has to be an emotion, it can't be truth. If truth has to be, it can't be truth. If truth is, truth is. The winds of evolution mean nature, mean nature as plants. And so man has to make a choice. Man's decency keeps him close to nature. 
man's forgetfulness can make him self-exile from nature. That means remember your greatness before you could forget it. In the subtitle I've written, Beyond Endless Self-Reinventionism, <clears throat> this part of the, <clears throat> this subtitle was inspired out of a moment where I suddenly noticed, what is my body doing, it is being there, what is my mind doing, being my body. And how the mind is being the body is that it's moving quicker than the body. And as it moves quicker than the body, it is reinventing itself faster than the body can change. If the body was changing faster than the mind, we would not know we have a mind. But because the mind is moving faster than the body, that means even as I'm speaking, it's like just a, a mere sound entering your ear is turning into your inner landscape. <clears throat> Whatever you're seeing. As the mind endlessly overlays possibility on a meaningless object, the object forgets it's actually the object and the attention becomes the sub subject. That means the brain is um, making itself alive. That means if we reduce the intelligence in, in the outer realms through the physical lens into just the brain and neural activity, why should neuron, why should there be an organ such as the brain? To subjectify itself. That means where in looking at an object do we understand how it's being a subject? Like why the subjective free will is as unique as it is. That means the mind is something we have but we can't touch. I can't touch my mind but it's as if my mind and awareness is embracing everything in it. It's as if my mind has touched the edges of the room the edges of the sky before my body can even look at it.
a quick fly through. The world was here, we were not conscious, the unconscious world was here. We emerge as an unconscious self and this is where we became, were a part of earth that separated from the earth. Another angle, another branch from this could be that the animals on this planet were brought here. Another angle is that on a cellular level, intelligent dust from one planet came to our planet. You know, in another angle, it could be interference uh, of, 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 of the galactic persona. <clears throat> and there's different angles. Or it could be a sort of the whole world is a simulation. You know, even if we entertain simulation theory, that means we are never our dream. That means if life is a dream, we are not, we're never this. Right, so if there is more, what is the glorification of knowledge in the outer realms? It should just be a z no glorification, just a medals for exploration. That means it, I don't know what pe what educational systems are doing, giving certifications doesn't like it, it's so ego driven. It's not. It's not. That means there should just be medals of honor in the educational system. <clears throat> medals of service, medals of exploration. You know, and everything's going to be recorded properly. You know, that's that's the educational system the world needs and, and an incredible retaliation against the void it's as if all human beings united and they were like okay now we march towards the unknown you know what else can we do here? that is the greatest uh, that is the big challenge that's it's as if they say you know uh, there's this uh, military tactic they say um, um, pretty much they say cut the head of the snake <laughs> And the whole snake, the body of the snake drops, right? We aim for the biggest challenger in the room. How we can stabilize meaning in the unknown. If we worship storytelling and people um, believe and disbelieve and a disbelief is a belief on a belief, it's like we have matter and antimatter. We have belief and anti-belief. It's like, it's like, <laughs> and so beyond the belief games, what we will be left as is unknown witness, unknown uh, conscious witness, and. It's, it's moves, literally think as if every decision you make is a chess move, suggest the uh, flight of your psychology into the moment. This may sound uh, like this is something I haven't shared, but there has been times in my life, <clears throat> and it, it is very abstract. You could see this as something where I, when I was doing it, it was like, um, it was my own personal uh it was for, okay, something from my own inner realms, okay? And so there was moments of, uh, in some sense, uh, how do I say it? Think of in moments of emergency or some sort of intensity in my life, I have evoked naturally, naturally without thought, through certain behavior, evoked something for my own mind, right? And that, that evocation was the calling of like one's own bigger presence in the room. It's as if, think of it as if. Is this on me? No, oh, okay. Think of it as if, uh, George Orwell in 1984 introduced us to Big Brother, this kind of like, I don't know, ego, egocentric surveillance, uh, kind of uh, like ignorant is bliss kind of realm, right, control. Now I want you to imagine the logos
is one of the great guardians of humanity. This is something very intense and whoever is listening as Aristotle says it's a sign of an educated mind to entertain an idea without accepting it. But for, for a second I see a branch into a theological angle, a crack in, <clears throat> in, in a wall where it's as if the idea of an angel, that means when human beings pray they, they request angels. You know, they request God's life from the religious lens, the theological lens. <clears throat> now, when they do that, they're requesting the angel, which an angel by definition, an archangel, by definition is the will of God. That means that God is the sun, the angels are the light beams. Okay? Now, we say one of the light beams fell. So something that was the divine will in the religious narrative is said to have fallen. Okay? Now think of it this way. There's the idea of, for example, Archangel Michael, Archangel, which is um, I, 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 like the shield of God or the sword of God. And then there was Archangel Gabriel, which was the messenger. <clears throat> and when it came to the fallen Archangel, which the name was Lucifer, and then it fell to whatever culture took it. But the idea is that that angel is the divine will, in some sense, the, the whole thing of the religious feeling of blasphemy when they look at art. Okay? <clears throat> so let me, let, me tell, let me explain this. In the sense of the fallen angel is the divine will protecting man from his own duality. What I'm trying to say is that when Carl Jung said we're like this consciousness and then we're surrounded with unconsciousness and there's endless archetypes out there and these archetypes become conscious based on how you live a life. And so the major archetype that in ancient books and society and morality and uh, all of this is even the afterlife and all of this is or, or uh, uh, sort of interdimensional, all these notions are about duality's place in our attention. And so the notion of the fallen angel was that the angel couldn't change itself. So it had to make the world wrong. That's how we in culture perceive that, right? But the idea is that it's as if the archangel could not exist without God like the other angels. Because what would they do or what would they retaliate to? So what I'm saying is now we have reached a point in reality where regardless of the outer realm symbolism, worshipping duality, the inner realm do symbolism, worshipping oneness, you know, non-dualism, it's like for now we need to find the pure human being in, in this giant fog of uh, uh, nature abduction by ideology and idealism. Like ideas are tools, but when the tool, like the person's held the tool so long, they are like, this tool is my hand. And someone's like, no, it's not. And the person looks at it and realizes it's not. Yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's it's time where there is, uh, in my science fiction, I pointed to this, but I'm not going to give anything away for now. But I'll tell you, I'll say one thing. There is a character where this character in the science fiction novel I've written set in the year 5025, it's prophesized, <clears throat> someone prophesizes for him that he will end the war of wars, whatever that is. And this character, who at the beginning, oh my god, I'm going to him. <laughs> It's as if all classifications of intelligence are connected by the human position. We center, we become human-centric, and then 
we become able to be dehumanized. We, that means we create a human headquarter, a human kingdom. We are super conscious of this human kingdom advancing. Then, <clears throat> in some sense, dehumanized states of mind can be studied, right? Because somebody can look at somebody dancing and somebody can look at them with uh, them dancing with music in the background and they're like, wow, what a great dancer. And then imagine and like uh, the, uh, the music is turned off and she's dancing and it's like reached a point where it's like, well, what is she dancing to? <laughs> so it, just the music, something from the context changing, we feel it's bizarre. The world is, um, has made it too easy to be cruel. The tides must change. The hunger of eons satisfied in an instant. And imagine people, all the desires they wanted, let's say you got them, what's going to happen then? You're going to desire something else, and what's going to happen then? You're going to desire, literally desire more, 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 literally, everybody saw Lord of the Rings, Shmigo, <clears throat> like that that kind of like, I don't know, ring obsessed creature, and they everybody laughed at, at this creature, or they were like, oh my god, look at this, look at this ridiculous creature, you know, <clears throat> but... Everybody is being literally like my precious, my precious, but at the word desire at the end, you know, that means you see like the wealthiest businessmen, they don't say that, but in their minds, they're like my precious, <laughs> my precious desire for more of my own expression, you know, but now it has to come to the collective expression. That means if you have resources, use it well, you know, that means, uh, 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 um, 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 I had this strange view, but um, I thought of what what if something globally could be tested in a capitalistic system where no person could be could have more than twenty million dollars. In one of my writings, this idea had come, right? <clears throat> where all human there was a threshold, and the rest the person could have, but the rest would go into collective initiatives. Not like charity, no, something of a global, a next level future civilization reform kind of nature, you know. That means tackling the global problems. That means imagine people suffering in the world. That's a giant on the planet, you know. This is, see, this is a, a monster on the planet that we have to tackle, you know. The species has to take down that kraken, you know. Let's say there, there isn't clean water on the planet, take down that kraken. We're going to go extinct because people don't care about the environment. Take down that crack and whatever it is, the effort of the human for the human must arise. And no longer, and this is something I'll tell you, this is the complex challenge. This is where, this is where everything comes to. If this was a strategy for an advanced civilization, it would all come to this. How willing people are to... Let go of the comfort of their animalism to enter the unknown where nobody knows what's going to happen and try to live as a multidimensionally civilized communicator. And you just do this. And there, it may not make sense. It may be easier to be to, to like, you know, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> be wild. I mean, this is something people don't realize. It, it, any human being cornered, eventually an animal instinctual wilderness comes, right? <clears throat> Unless they, they have never experienced wilderness. But I'll tell you, like, there, there is something that there's, there's, the, there's a wilderness in every human being. Just because we're wearing clothing and we're just like, you know, Speaking nicely doesn't mean we we are we have stopped being animals, 
right? Now imagine in the outer realms we have stopped behaving like animals, but in the inner realms, cruelty, violence, savageness, you know, taking and willing, get willing the other to lose, all of this is still like, holy shit, the person has the mind of an animal, you know, their body's behaving civilized, but the mind is like something else, it's like, what's that creature, you know? <laughs> so that's why I'm saying the, the, the darkness of dehumanization. That means you got to care for the living truth or in some sense, why are the eyes open and why are you alone? <clears throat> so the mystery stands and the civilization is just warming up. And right now, everybody should feel incredibly free to communicate because no, never on this planet has there been, there has been more silence in the universe then there has been speech. So human beings can all talk a lot, but they will have talked nothing. This talking a lot is a fragment when you can consider the how long the universe is. So technically, it's impossible to talk a lot. In, you know, in a, in, a, in a let's say I don't know 4.5 billion year landscape, it's impossible to do anything wrong in that context. You know. That means our judgments are just context accepted. We accept the context, but at the same time, the new ethos hasn't been hasn't been created. That means I'm kind of like suggesting like an ideological time traveler, where it's like a person their physical body is in one let's say in one view of the space time continuum, but your mind, where your memories and if a person can visualize a cube in the air with their mind. They can visualize also cultural evolution, social evolution, you know, arbitrary evolution, even a branch of evolutionism that has to do with how the body is being a psychological entity. Yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad I found the word arbitrary evolutionism. Yeah, that's my. I, I think I've just created an incredible word for my philosophy. Arbitrary evolutionism. It's like I believe in evolution, but it's all arbitrary. <laughs> oh man, where are we really? Please in the comment, guys. For all those people listening, please in the comment section. Um, write your answer to this question. Where are we as beings? <laughs> I feel like reading something from um, this work I wrote called The Language Threshold. Uh, sorry, not The Language Threshold. Uh, the Source of Language. And it's like a series of essays. <clears throat> and... for you a, an essay I wrote and uh, from this uh, unpublished book called uh, The Source of Language and it's a giant book there's a lot of essays in The God Within the Animal it can be it can be said the body is an animal your mind is God. Actually, let me change this up. This. Okay, 
found the right song. <sighs> the God within the animal. It can be said it can be said the body is an animal. Your mind is God. Or rather, your body is made of earth and your mind is made of sky. Therefore, all communication can be said to be the communication and movement between the earth and sky, the body and mind and the animal and God. Eastern mysticism shines upon the view of the world that it is an unspeakable organism beyond the description of its parts. What that means is that from the shadows you cannot discover the true nature of the sun. Let us find the enlightenment that is quicker than light. For if you were an artist that wanted to draw your greatest memory of existence on a canvas ready for visual paint, how the world happens is quite the most beautiful thing. Many think life is about its length, but it's about its depth. The depth of life experience is a suggestion <clears throat> that whenever, that when, excuse me, the depth of life experience is a suggestion that when you wonder what is the best way to live life, it will be said you can get lost in a game of duality, which is the unhidden world that language walks on, or you can liberate yourself from how if you were to think beyond thought, there would be no thinker. Suddenly. The words of language have finally found themselves transparent to the world of direct experience. How you acknowledge this moment is important because every idea that you have on your moment will create an unconscious cycle of karma. In other words, Language and art for the conscious self-aware being can no longer be separate. How the moment must be acknowledged is that when you ask, who is asking? Who is the seer of thought? How is there also here? The source of language is, not, is always beyond what the language is. As Mr. Within has said, the letters of the alphabet are not enough. This universe is not tangible, is not a tangible fixed concept or idea, and it will never be. For as long as we have imagination, science cannot have the loudest voice. A self-reflective divine direct experience will suddenly, through the gates of silence and stillness, very intensely tear up egotistical conclusions about reality. In a presence in which if you looked in your morning mirror, you would not see yourself as separate from the universe, but as the whole universe, as one moment of absolute being. You're not just looking in the mirror, the whole universe is. Are the letters in the alphabet enough? Enlightenment is stepping out of time through a self-reflection beyond time. No two people would be one person, for there would be just for there would just be one person. When you flow with your true nature, that is the whole moment, you don't connect too many ideologies to self, for self is your pure moment, always as it was always as it is. There is no supreme idea of a hierarchical intelligence with anger issues. The God of the heart is the best God, for it beats at the center. It, excuse me. The God of the heart is the best God, for it beats as the center of the breathable universe. Behind the eyes of ideas, there is no third eye of an enlightened master. There is the beauty of a moment that is its own mirror, polished by nature. We are all divinity's work. If you look, if you look closely at these letters, you will see they are they are artwork. For abstraction is only pushed back by society's reality, for language was the smudge 
and direct experience is the glory wiping the mirror of new vision. Songs are out of control this episode. Guys, you know how they say like a bunch of wild horses appeared? A, bu a bunch of wild ambient songs appeared in the middle of this talk. Just, just, just you know, it's part of nature, guys. Don't worry. <laughs> Anyways, to continue, uh, where was I? The God of the heart is the best God, for it beats at the, as the center of the breathable universe. Behind the eyes of ideas, there is no third eye of an enlightened master. There is a beauty... <coughs> oh, actually, I read that. For abstraction is only pushed back by society's reality. For language was the smudge, and direct experience is the glory wiping the mirror of new vision. The mind, conceptually, is void, but rich with subjective design. Has a thought taken off its mask? Has your soul or presence realized it was never an individual soul and the teacup had to be empty before it was full? Before it's full? Can Zen masters break dance? Or uh, can break dance, but there's a space between the word break dance. So, can Zen masters break dance? <laughs> Are words fighting back? The mystery of conception is always uh, the mystery of conception always points to an axis unconsciously thrown into the endless abyss of the unknown. Is your personality an unnecessary scene for your true presence? What has the Buddha said that we have not listened to? Whose story is history? Transcendence means direct experience is all that is happening. Beyond planes of action, the wise man listens to the self beyond words, in which sincerity has made too humble to her to dying world. How do the eternal behave to, tem to temporal rudeness? Don't stay thirsty, my friends. Just walk omnisciently as your true nature. Imagination and technology are the horses if logic, rationality, and divine intuitive intelligence are the chariot. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, now wonder, dear reader, who is sitting in this grand picture that is the chariot of the moment? What is the texture of your experience, or have you not playfully discovered the oneness of love yet? For in selfless devotional serf service, life, the tree outside, uh, excuse me, for in selfless devotional service, like the tree, like the tree outside, to our moment, we shall live fruitfully without prior karmic disturbances, boomerang from insincere moments of unnecessary actions of thoughts. <clears throat> a smart man looks in front of him. A, a wise man is the whole moment that sees. Beyond ordinary perception, just like the stars promised, we are extraordinary. God, how long is this not so <laughs> Creativity means on the surface of the rock there are flows of communicating intelligence, as if if our consciousness was a drop of intelligence, it is rather present through a river of multidimensional intelligence. So beyond the concept of ideology, that that with a um, so beyond the concept of ideology, that with a simple awareness to what is within us, we have not only become the source of language, but the source of all light. There are two ways to look at our world in regards to a multidimensional context. Either we are within another world, or another world is within us. It seems the cosmic fractal in nature of the body never stopped growing. Wisdom originates from self-reflection. Trust the moment and let the divine smile. You are the whole of life, not a part of it. You're, you are not on a spinning rock in the middle of nowhere. You, in caps, are your, in caps, whole moment. <laughs> Beyond these words, you're your own enlightenment. We must conduct our consciousness with the full awareness of our whole moment, regardless of how multidimensional or not it would be. 
the pilots of consciousness are here to navigate as the whole moment of existence. <coughs> that includes enlightenment too. How much do you? How much do? Uh, how much do? You, how much do you trust the intelligence that you are beyond language? How does Pegasus fly and ride the floating fields of paradise at the same time? Perhaps if you stop thinking you are a thought that gets wounded by this association. Realize you are not a thought and you never were. You are a moment of existential experience untouchable by all that is, for it is defined based and by all of it. My beloved friend, you're your own torchbearer. God is already its own exploration. If you only, if you only think you are a creator, uh, I've written self in brackets here. You will build blindly. Be your moment. There's nothing uh, simpler than that. Are are you reading this book or self-reflectively observing how the nature of your own mind emanates into reality? It's simple. Be sincere, and the seer of all sin is beyond sin. You are the path. There is nothing else. You know, the poet Rumi says, out beyond ideas of right doing and wrong doing, there's a place. I'll meet you there. I feel that's like <clears throat> beyond the battlefield. That means we have to climb out of our individual, our self-suffering, created by our own self, our co communication, self-communication, that means self-to-self -self communication. And then the, uh, we have to climb the and get out of the suffering communicated by self and other communication, and then get out of the communication of even blaming the world for being cruel and all that. That's world communication. And then when we're at that void, that that very liberated state of mind, <clears throat> we found the clear stage, you know. And so what I mean by this. that there was this idea in Sufi mysticism of veils. That means reality is covered in veils. And Hafez, the Sufi mystic, in one of his poems, it was next level, I don't remember the exact poetic line, but he, he referred the wrinkles on the dress of this beautiful girl as like hidden universes. You know? <laughs> something, something like to that level. You know? That means when we reach that empty stage, that sort of unconditional clarity, regardless of ideological outcome. So it's like where Rumi says, he, he, Rumi, the second part of the quote says, when the soul sits on that grass, the world is too full to talk about. That means once you are witnessing your individual life, and your collective life, and when they sync up, now they are not in sync. Now they're blind to each other, and society's kind of like a, like a paper shredder, you know. You know this 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 girl in the photo picture, whoever the artist is. By the way, guys, whoever sees hears these talks, the pictures I post, I find them from a random wallpaper site. And the reason I post them is because I want to figure out who the artists are. You know, that's something I realized. Like, you know, I would love to know. So whoever knows the artist, <coughs> um, you can share their names, please. And uh, you have done. I don't know, your universal sector service, you know. <laughs> so, rekindle your human honor. The species, the advanced civilization is not here yet, but in the inner realms it can be. In the inner realms one can live up to their true being, which is the whole point of life, you know. You know, I want to go into a quote tunnel. I feel like a...
this is strange, but um, Napoleon. I don't know why. <laughs> why uh, I feel like Napoleon Bonaparte quotes are like uh, maybe helpful right now for all those people who are interested in French emperors. Like um, you're gonna enjoy this portion of the episode. <laughs> Napoleon says, Victory is not always winning the battle, but rising every time you fall. Napoleon Bonaparte says, If you build an army of 100 lions and their leader is a dog, in any fight the lions will die like a dog. But if you build an army of 100 dogs and their leader is a lion, all dogs will fight as a lion. Napoleon says the reason most people fail instead of succeed is they trade what they want most for what they want at the moment. <clears throat> Napoleon Bonaparte says speeches pass away but acts remain. Oh wow, that means one's, um, that's where the true program, the true, that's where the show is. <laughs> Speech, speech, speeches pass away, but acts remain. This is a very really important quote. I'm going to share it in the. All right, guys. For those people who miss Napoleon, I've shared the quote. <laughs> you know, you know. Sometimes I'm so astonished. You know, for a. Persian kid who wanted to be a footballer when he was young. Now I'm talking, you know, you know reading Napoleon quotes. You know, it's like life takes you everywhere. You know. <laughs> okay. Napoleon Bonaparte says the only way to lead people is to show them a future. A leader is a dealer in hope. Napoleon Bonaparte says, never interrupt your enemy when he's making a mistake. <laughs> Napoleon Bonaparte says, if you wish to be a success in the world, promise everything, deliver nothing. Deliver nothing. Promise everything, deliver nothing. What does he mean? If you want, wish to be, literally in the previous quote, he's saying you got to act. But then he's saying, I think he means that... Um, um, share, share a collective idea and then it's like the hive mentality and then the hive mentality builds itself so technically with the idea there the, the engagement will build itself I don't know <clears throat> Napoleon says courage isn't having the strength to go on it is going on when you don't have strength Yeah, this is endless endurance. When you cultivate endless endurance, you strangely, doesn't matter what context you see life, you care for the effort of the moment. Yeah, the, the effort of the moment, yeah. Anyways. <laughs> Napoleon Bonaparte says the best way to make everyone poor is to insist on equality of wealth. Napoleon Bonaparte says the purpose of religion is to keep the poor from killing the rich. <laughs> oh man. <clears throat> you know, a knife could be used to cut fruit. And a person can have a healthy diet, or a knife could be used to hurt people, you know. Ideas are left to their users. The destiny of ideas are left to their users. 
Napoleon says, it is not necessary to bury the truth, it is sufficiently merely, it is sufficient merely to de delay it until nobody cares. No, um, it's not necessary to bury the truth, it is sufficient merely to delay it until nobody cares. Napoleon Bonaparte says there are only two forces that unite men, fear and interest. Fear is like the void mentality because we're going to do, everything's going to be, the human, human manifestation's going to, you know, transition. Technically, there's fear is, is the, you know, <clears throat> algorithm. Uh, the instinctual algorithm, but interest, uh, interest is like the conscious algorithm, right? It's like the conscious activity, like interest has to do with your mind's life, fear has to do with your body's life. Because a mind that isn't an object, how could something that isn't an object fear itself? Fear an object. Napoleon says, impossible is the word found only in a fool's dictionary. Wise people create opportunities for themselves and make everything possible. Yeah, because the world deserves to update, you know. It, 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 it gets boring when patterns repeat. Now, if we had this mentality in civilization, the advanced civilization would happen quickly. Napoleon Bonaparte says, until you spread your wings, you'll have no idea how far you can fly. That means until you enter the unknown, you don't know what you know. Just like warriors would go and they would train, training meant they would, they would implement the expression until they could control it, until they could wield it. The moment you could control something, you, you had understood it, then your training is complete. <clears throat> then you move on. If you can complete, really quickly understand something, you can bypass training. But then it becomes to the physical requirement. So then the physical, if it's a martial art, then. But if it's not martial art, you can instantly bypass. <clears throat> Napoleon says, in war, as in prostitution, amateurs are often better than professionals. I think it's because the professional gets the ego, the ego reduces their creativity, the amateur doesn't have an ego yet because it doesn't know how the battlefield is, so the amateur has more creativity. Maybe. Napoleon says envy is a de declaration of inferiority. Yeah, that means anybody who's envious on this planet, Napoleon is looking down on you as if you're inferior, you know. Are you going to take that? You know? <laughs> Napoleon Bonaparte says, the world is not ruined by the wickedness of the wicked, but by the weakness of the good. Incredible. Yeah. It's because, you know, good is defined by the past rather than its free liberty in the future. We have to plant the seeds of liberty for the future now. And we do that by the way we live, by the, the, ener the way you carry your energy like an Olympian running with a torch. You know, it's like, where are you carrying your eyes to? Where are you journeying in the space-time continuum? Where is the motive? Where is the boundary? These are all questions that surpass the classroom of life. Or any sort of uh, linguistic enslavement of it. You see, reality is a movement ultimately. Now then, we say, okay, it's an, it seems to be intelligent, right? So, <laughs> so because we see it's intelligent, then we are saying, all right, what is the intelligent movement? And this question takes us to the strange point where the mind is, the brain is projecting the mind, but we need a mind to be able to create the concept of the brain. That means we need a mind to have a body. We have a body that is, we need to have a body to have a mind, right? There is, a, there's a codependence. There's a ridiculous codependence of this. This literally means that we can pinpoint a body in time. We cannot pinpoint a mind in time because mind is creating the concept of time. This means a crack in the linguistic simulation. We found the glitch. This means human innovation and exploration. Now more than ever, the wilderness of your mind is to reveal itself. But not the wilderness of the mind in the savageness, but in just this echoing calling, right? <clears throat> there was this idea of, it's like, it's the legend of the castles in the sky. 
Okay, this is part of the Earth's history, and it doesn't mean this is truth, this doesn't mean this is enlightenment. It just means that this is a something in history, that it's literally an algorithm, it's the archaic revival of the legend of the castle in the sky. What that means is, somehow in ancient times, where that concept came, and it wasn't hard, I mean, you could totally see a king, like, looking at his kingdom, and being like, oh, a nice kingdom, and then the kingdom's like, how else can I upgrade my kingdom, and then the king saw clouds, like, what if my kingdom was in, in the clouds, right, and the king was like, yo, scribe, write this down, you know, a kingdom in the clouds, it's a cool idea, you know, somebody's gonna care, you know, and you know, who knew, you know, I gave this fault to cast. So the castle in, in the sky is the suggestion of the evolution towards the future's possibility rather than how the past is telling us it's impossible. It's like when something is being considered impossible, but you saw the past, you're like, okay, thank you, please sit down. All my memories of, of like whatever I've done in the past, the new is new. That is the secret of creativity. It's actually not that you know what to do. Creative people, th uh, people who are not creative think creativity is something you're doing. It is just the edges of your sight. And the moment you go beyond it, you go into direct experience. When you synchronize and you care to create something, then the energy just manifests. What that means is, um, I was trying to comprehend the idea of the polymath. That means back in the day, I don't know what it was like. They were geniuses. Like they were like the, in multiple fields. They would they would have talent. Like when you go see Da Vinci, this dude like wrote with one hand and drew with one hand. It's like if he worked in a magazine company, he'd be like a you know employee of the month or something. You know. So, <laughs> but it was like. It, it, like it, it eternally employee of the month, you know, like literally like they would just 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 carve this picture into the wall or something, you know, like <laughs> So Da Vinci and I was like what is that? and there's many human beings all over the planet from different cultures It's just you can somebody's probably done the research out there um, if, and if somebody hasn't you know uh, uh, university students should start writing their thesis all their thesis on intelligence. You have to connect it to somehow intelligence in the comparison of a singular dimension and a multi-dimensional dimension, right? <clears throat> Rather than just uh, proving the past is going to maybe be right. Like what kind of, uh, you know, sometimes I wonder the educational system has found a great way to waste time. That means I didn't realize the teacher said pay attention, but the mystery of life was what it's like. That imagine a child, day, a person daydreaming, and the teacher's like, "Hey, you know, how the teacher has like a ruler and just bangs on the table like as if he's like I don't know, like you know, possessed by you know an angry childhood and <laughs> and the student is in some sense like." in the middle of a daydream or something you know and the teachers like pay attention and the student didn't realize that was a fascinating event in the mind that means there should I, in the future educational system it's going to become like literally it's the teachers are going to get fined if a, if, a, if a person is actually daydreaming in class and the teacher interrupts them if a person falls asleep in class the teacher was boring and the teacher has to accept that you know what I mean? like it has to be that way <laughs> You know, and if the student has fallen asleep, the student doesn't understand why it's in the classroom either. Like that has to be dogs as well. But if the teacher is so boring, because I I remember there was a teacher. This teacher literally was like I think he was treating the classroom as a bunch of animals. That's the way he was teaching. Literally, our classroom like I'm thinking of my middle school. Like it was like a <laughs> like. But uh, you know what it is? It's like the teachers didn't have respect for the students, so they didn't care for how the student was being a human being to itself. Teachers who get angry should leave the classroom, you know? And there should be a backup teacher, like a fire extinguisher, like around, you know? <clears throat> you know? And not a backup one backup teacher. Let's say a classroom gets out of control, then what happens is two backup teachers. <laughs> My God, the educational system is like people should go to the educational system to study how to create a good educational system. That's what the educational system should teach. You know.
<laughs> but anyways guys I mean reality moves in so many ways who knows what's gonna happen tomorrow you know like that's the whole point of life if, if we knew what was gonna happen uh, ultimately then there would be no point to living then the person would not there would be no reason so the unknown is really where the purpose of life is found that means people think the purpose of life is what they, they have they can know it you know it, you will only it's it's endlessly going towards the unknown because it's the reverse in society what are we doing just every thing everything is fixated on knowing things in a specific way i'm like okay what's the reverse of this everybody can visualize even a young child can visualize you yeah. know we have singular obsession, and so now we require multidimensional freedom. Because multidimensionality means nothing is good or bad, that's just how many angles of it we've seen so far. And everything can have infinite angles. That means a person can say there's endless ways to see this moment. A moment can be judged in endless, through endless narratives, right? So which narrative do we choose? Right, so the mystery of the world story goes into a superior point where human beings are like, okay, a, a new behavioral order comes in. Right, so this behavioral order means human beings have to become incredibly charitable and tolerant. And for a moment, even though even though human beings around you may not real may not behave that way, but you behave as if they are members of your civilization, members of your species. That means if in the future, let's say a, we, our civilization, like aliens came down, leaders shake hands, a, a, a sort of, uh, you know, galactic diplomacy, you know, <clears throat> and so citizens were going there and aliens were coming and living in the planet and passports had like a planet on them, a planet section on them. Or a universal sector section. <clears throat> Or human feature section or something or human trait sections you know like if an alien has shape-shifting abilities you would probably be written in its passport in the future <laughs> <coughs> but I'm saying when that happens imagine a, in a neighborhood a group of aliens are like discriminating against a human being how would we feel we would be like Aliens have come to our planet and they're discriminating against our our species, right? So we will feel the bondhood of species, right? We will realize our design is the common language. That means if you look like a human being, you're a human, you're part of humanity. It's like instantly re reconnect yourself to that idea and that ideal, right? And don't get attached by it. On but honor means how you hold the sword and how you hold the shield. Right, and so if if someone has an ego, they might misinterpret honor as just endlessly using the sword, or they may misinterpret honor as only holding a shield. You know, not realizing that life is about you. You observe, and then action. You give your mind in some time, and the action arises. Our intelligence is involuntary. That means a person <clears throat> instantly can pilot their attention to a completely different way. The moment as meaning. That means we have to prepare for a giant uh, wave of multidimensionality that's going to just remodel, make, it's going to be a multidimensional uh, collective makeover. All cultural programs will be shifted because infinity is now breaching the possibility of the individual more and more clearly. Because ultimately, once you free yourself from the world, and you're done with that, you're done with yourself, <clears throat> that means you have become all that is the world. So when you have become all that is the world, there is no human mind, right? So if we had a universal mind, we could never know it in the linguistic way we are desiring, right? But if the linguistic desire goes aside and sincere living activates the unknown, I'm telling you, don't uh, let let spirituality be a surprise. Just keep your attention humanized. That means, imagine you just do this. You try to do the um, the most humanly possible behavior, and you'll be fascinated. 
the metaphysics comes on its own. That means if you care about the physics, you'll notice the metaphysics. If you don't care about the physics, then your metaphysics is disconnected with reality. And so it's not that the physical is real or the uh, immaterial is real when they're codependent. It's just that um, if we, it's either reality is, uh, ima either imagination is real or reality is imagined. Right? We're imagining reality or, uh, re uh, yeah, we're imagining reality or re uh, reality is imagination. So, you know, that, uh, that model. So, humanity. is way more intelligent than it can never know. Our manifestation is conscious intelligence. It's just the tip of the iceberg. <clears throat> and human, again, I'll, I'll reemphasize this. Humanity is a conscious tribe. So p every human being, I feel personally, <clears throat> should have a responsibility uh, to communicate their inner realms, which that is something that in the outer realms, the advanced civilization will take care in your inner realms, only you can share. That means people have to just gift um, their future and the future is building them as a gift. So what I mean by this is that we serve the world in order for the world to serve our species. We serve the, the species. <clears throat> that means an ultimate kindness with all that is. You have just chosen to trust the world before you can doubt it. And you will remain in that simplicity, in that strange abyss of, okay, I am being. And life is being, and the body is happening, and the mind is noticing, and the witness cannot speak for it is space, and space is the whole moment, and the whole moment is the silent knowing. That's how I speak. Literally as if I'm as, we are, the souls are like spheres and inside them there are simulations. And the moment the simulation notices what's outside of the sphere, it can no longer be a simulation, so it is free. What a song. Ah. <clears throat> Just humanity will wake up. 
I predict if certain great transformations happen in 600 years from now, imagine you've, you're taking your dog um, for a walk in a park, <clears throat> and as you've taken, you're taking your dog on a walk in the park, first of all, the dog just doesn't have a leash, it just has a, a sort of, kind of like, let's say nanotechnology sphere following it, that in any moment it can become like a leash, or it can just in mid-air hold the neck of the dog, just in mid -air, become a leash in mid-air, you know. So whatever, let's say this person's walk, or whatever, let's say they trust, this person trusts their dog, and it's one of those great dogs that, I mean, I, I've never had a dog, but, <laughs> but I've seen people with dogs, and in, in some sense, um, it's, it, it's like family to them. And so this is, this means, uh, so anyways, this person, imagine you're walking with your dog, and you suddenly see, wait a minute. Are the skyscrapers getting taller? Wait a minute. And suddenly you see all human infrastructure. This is the legend of the archaic, the full uh, uh, revival of the legend of the castle in the sky. The sky kingdoms, you know? The birth of the sky kingdoms. where all human infrastructure lifts up into the air. And for 2,000 years, I call this civilization 2.0, for 2,000 years we just, you know, let the earth breathe and the greatest botanical project to restore the earth as if it's an uninhabited planet we think. You know, a person shouldn't want their they should only wonder about one thing, I think. I think one desire I feel is technically not a desire, it's an aim. <clears throat> but the person should wonder what their most advanced presence of intelligence is and wonder what those eyes deserve, not the eyes of what they were. Not the eyes of what the present and the what others are saying. Not the, the eyes of their most, for the furthest edge of the greatest uh, um, presence to your attention you can see. Dare to go to the edge. Dare to the furthest. That means right now, wherever you are, try this as an exercise. Wonder about, whoever's listening, wonder about your greatest sense, your greatest version of you. As a being, it's not limited to anything, so your inner realms can animate, but the greatest version of you, and now keep in mind the human's uh, effort of an advanced civilization and humanity waking up from its linguistic slum. So wonder about your greatest self in, in, the, in the greatest civilization, in the greatest world, and wonder what, how, what, what kind of a moment those eyes deserve, and I will tell you, your greatness won't lead you astray because it needs you to express itself. The Logos is just human beings who um, care for the world. They, they in some sense, um, um, they're given surfboards, you know. <laughs> They asked this Yogi Kabir, they told this guy, yo man, how long does it take to get enlightened? And he looked at him and he said, half of a half of an instant, you know? <laughs> it takes half of a half of an instant. That means, buddy, it's an instant. Your attention is instantly being all that it is. Isn't it a miracle? <laughs> Is it a miracle that our mind has a glow, and in that glow, the story of our world turns? Whoever you are, now more than ever, it is, it, life requires you to become the greatest inventor you know, in both the inner and outer. And let me tell you why. Because in inventionism, we are trying to see 
uh, we like the inventors see something in the inner realm of probability, okay, a, a parallel universe of probability where the invention is already made. Then the inventor brings it down on paper, right? Or let's say first the inventor voices it, then the inventor writes it down, then the inventor draws it, then the inventor finds the resources and starts building it three dimensionally, right? Then uh, upon testing and further just perfection, it becomes. It becomes ready, and then the invention has at least some sort of shape, early shape of an invention, like the first prototype, right? <clears throat> and so this invention, now I want you to see that every moment you're the invention of your effort into the world. That is more unknown than known. And I have actually um, the book Meditations from Marcus Rivas here. I'll leave you off with a passage from him. He says, all our bodies, in brackets, being of one nature with the whole and cooperating it as our limbs to do with each other, pass through, so all our bodies pass through the universal substance as through, as through a swirling stream. How many a Chris, oh my God, how many a Chrysippus, a Socrates, and an Epictetus has eternity already swallowed. This same thought should strike you about any man at all and anything. I have only one anxiety that I, this is Marcus Aurelius saying this, guys. Uh, 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 this meditations are his notes. People found that he had journals of like his own philosophical, he was a hidden philosopher. He says, I have only one anxiety that I myself should not do something which the human constitution does not intend or does not intend in this way or at this time. Soon you will have forgotten all things. Soon all things will have forgotten you. It is human nature to love even those who trip and fall. This follows if, you're, if you reflect at the, at, at the time that all men are brothers, that they go wrong through ignorance, not intent, that in a short while both you and they will be dead, and above all that the man has not harmed you. He has not made you. He has not made your directing mind worse than it was before. That means everything's updating. Univers Marcus Aurelius says universal nature uses the substance of the universe like wax, making now the model of a horse, then melting it down and using its material for a tree, next for a man, next for something else. Each one of these subsists for only the briefest time. It is no more hardship for a box to be broken up than to be put together. A deep scowl on the face is contrary to nature, and when it becomes habitual expressiveness, begins to die or is even finally extinguished beyond rekindling. Try to attend to this very point, that this is something against reason. In the field of moral behavior, if even the consciousness of doing wrong is lost, what reason is there left for living? Wow, he says, if even the consciousness of doing wrong is lost, what reason is there left for living? That, that means our life is how conscious we are to live with. <clears throat> Marcus Aurelius says, all that you are, all that you see, will in a moment be changed by the nature which governs the whole. It will create other things out of this material, and then again others out of that, so that the world is always young. Wow. That means change, universal change, is keeping the world young, you know? We're all dying so the world is young, you know, it stays young, you know. We're such remarkable human beings. <laughs> Marcus Aurelius says, when someone does, when someone does you some wrong, you should consider immediately what judgment of good or evil uh, led him to wrong you. When you see this, you will pity him and not feel surprise or anger. You yourself either still share his view of good or something like it, in which case you should understand and forgive. If, on the other hand, <clears throat> you no longer judge such things as either good or evil, it will be the easier for you to be patient with the unsighted. Yeah, that means just be patient with the world that's trying to figure out its uh, future. Do not dream of possession of what you do not have. Ra rather reflect on the greatest blessings in what you do have, and on their account remind yourself how much they would have been missed if they were not there. But at the same time you must be careful not to let your pleasure in them habituate you to dependency, to avoid distress if they are sometimes absent. Withdraw into yourself 
It is the nature of the rational directing mind to be self-content with acting rightly and the calm it thereby enjoys. Erase the print of imagination. Stop the puppet strings of impulse. Define the present moment of time. Recognize what happens to you or to another. Analyze and divide the event into the causal and the material. Think of your final hour. Leave the wrong done by another where it started. That means don't touch evil. <clears throat> that means because it's unnecessary to keep the algorithm alive in a civilization that wants us to see what, what the limited time frame it has, uh, if it can get to the f finish line of seeing how advanced it was before its eyes closed, before extinction becomes unnecessary, uh, like, you know, the, the, the great goodbye. <clears throat> Marcus Aurelius says, but at the same time you must be careful not to let your pleasure in, their, in them habituate you to dependency, to avoid distress if they are sometimes absent. Okay, let me read that again. Oh my god. Do not dream of possession of what you do not have, rather reflect on the greatest blessings and what you do have, and on, the, on their account remind yourself how much they would have been missed if they were not there. But at the same time, you must be careful not to let your pleasure in them habituate you to dependency, to avoid distress if they are sometimes absent. Withdraw into yourself. Oh yeah, I totally be reading this. With, with, <laughs> withdraw into yourself. It is the nature of the rational directing mind to be self-content with acting right in the calm it thereby enjoys. <clears throat> oh my god, where was I? Um, uh, define the present moment of time, recognize what happens to you or to another, analyze and divide the event into the causal and the material, think of your final hour, leave the wrong done by another where it started, stretch your thought to parallel what is being said, let your mind get inside what is happening and who, and who is doing it, take your joy in simplicity and in integrity and in indifference to all that lies between virtue and vice, love mankind. That means everybody listening, Marcus Aurelius is telling you love mankind. I mean, like all those kids in ice, uh, educational systems trying to be cool, you know. <laughs> uh, follow God. Democritus says all else is subject to the law of convention. Only the elements are absolute and real. But enough for you to remember that all is subject to law. <clears throat> Precepts. So, okay, I'll read that again. Democritus says all else is subject to the law of convention, only the elements are absolute and real. Marcus Aurelius says, but enough for you to remember that all is subject to law. Precepts reduce to very few. On death, either dispersal if we are atoms or if we are a unity, extinction or a change of hope. On pain, unbreakable pain carries us off. Chronic pain can be borne with an E at the The mind preserves its own serenity by withdrawal and the directing reason is not impaired by pain. It is for the parts injured by the pain to protest if they can. On fame, look at their minds, the nature of their thought and what they seek or avoid and see how just as drifting sands constantly overlay the previous sand, so in our lives, what we once did is very quickly covered over by sub subsequent layers. That means, I'll just pause here, Marcus, or this is saying something important. When you look at human beings, look at their minds, look at the nature of their thought. That means the disposition of the character of the person. Is the person, what kind of character does the person have? Right? And then Marcus Aurelius says, and what they seek and avoid. That means look at people when they avoid something and look at people when they seek something. Right? So people don't realize when they avoid something, they're showing the world they're avoiding it. That's just that they, it's like the mind can't be hidden the moment you're animated. It's, it's an expression. That means we need the mind to express. So how can our expression hide our intelligence? So technically, and even if in the future it's, it's a collective vision, of a mind, technically, no, and, no, and nobody should fear anything. Everybody already knows everything. That means I'm just giving these talks and saying it, but on an energetic level, I mean, energy knows everything you can be. <coughs> uh, 
and to end um, before I get to it. And he says, So to a man endowed with noble intelligence and the vision of all time and all being, do you think that this human life will seem of great importance? Impossible. <coughs> he said, so, so such a man will not think there's anything fearful in death either. Certainly not. A king's lot to do good and be damned. It is shameful that the face should be so obedient, shaping and ordering its expression as the mind dictates, when the mind cannot impose its own shape and order on itself. Mere things, brute facts, should not provoke your rage. They have no mind to care. That means things that, if a person is getting angry, if like their foot hits a table, that makes no sense. It doesn't have a mind. If you're getting angry at something that doesn't have a mind, it's like getting angry at an object. You know? <laughs> You know, it's like the jokes write themselves, you know. <clears throat> Marcus Aurelius says, May you give joy to the immortal gods and joy to us. Ripe years of corn are reaped, and so are lives. One stands, another falls. If I and my two sons are now no more, the gods concerned this too will have its cause. For good and right stand on my side. Don't join in mourning or in ecstasy. But I could give this man a proper answer. I would say you are mistaken, my friend, if you think that a man or any worth at all should take into account the risk of life or death, and not have as his sole consideration in any action whether he's doing right or wrong, the act of a good man or a bad. The truth of the matter, my fellow Athenians, is this. Whatever position a man has taken up in his own best judgment, or is assigned by his commander, there, it seems to me, he should stay and face the danger, give no thought to death or anything else before this honor. But my dear fellow, consider it possible that nobility and virtue are something other than saving one's life, or having it saved. Could it not be that anyone who is truly a man should dismiss any concern for a particular length of life, and not simply live for the sake of living? Rather, he should leave all this to God and believe what the woman folk say, that no one ever escapes the day of his fate. His thoughts should be on this further question, how best to live his life in the time he has to be alive. Observe the moment of the stars as if you were running their courses with them, and let your mind constantly dwell on the changes of the elements into each other. Such imaginings wash away the filth of life on the ground. Further, when your talk is about mankind, view earthly things as if looking down on them from some point high above. Flocks, armies, farms, weddings, divorces, births, deaths, the hub hubbub of the law courts, de <laughs> desert places, various foreign nations, festivals, funerals, markets, all the medley of the world and the ordered conjunction, conjunction of opposites. <coughs> Look back over the past, all those many changes of dynasties, and you can foresee the future too. It will be completely alike, <laughs> incapable of deviating from the rhythm of the present. So for the study of human life, 40 years are as good as 10,000. What more will you see? Again. What is born of earth goes back to earth, but the growth from heavenly seed returns whence it came to heaven. That means, check this out, you are a body, you start as a materialist. And here Marcus Aurelius is kind of pointing to a metaphysics where how you live, how you live creates your soul. As if he says, what is born of earth goes back to earth, but the growth from heavenly seed returns whence it came to heaven. He's saying that the way you live suggests where in the continuum, space-time continuum, you're tuning yourself to, as, as I don't know, as multidimensional mystery. <laughs> Marcus Aurelius says, or else this, a dissolution of the nexus of atoms and senseless molecules likewise dispersed. Oh my God, what sentence. Who knew conquers write poetry? I mean, I've, I've, you know, I've looked in the mirror before these eyes, but come on now. <laughs> I'm just highlighting it. Okay. 
Marcus Aurelius says again, which special food or drink or sorcery? Seeking a channel from the stream of death, the wind that blows from God, we must endure and labor on complaining. On complaining. Amen. Better at throwing his man, but no more public spirited or more decent or more disciplined to circumstance or more tolerant of neighbors' faults, <clears throat> where a task can be accomplished in accordance with. Uh, the reason which gods and men share. There is nothing to be afraid of, because where there is possibility of benefit from an action which moves along the proper path, following our human constitution, there should be no lurking fear of any harm. Everywhere and all the time it is up to you to honor God and contentment with your present circumstance, to treat the men who are your present company with justice, and to lavish thought on every present impression in your mind so that nothing slips in past slips in past your understanding. <clears throat> Do not look around at the directing minds of other people, but keep looking straight ahead to where nature is leading you, both universal nature and what happens to you and your own nature in what you must do yourself. Every creature must do what follows from its own constitution. The rest of creation is constituted to ser serve rational beings. <clears throat> Just as in everything else, the lower exists for the higher. But rational beings are here to serve each other. So the main principle in man's constitution is the social. The second is resistance to the promptings of the flesh. It is the specific poverty of rational and intelligent activity to isolate itself and never be influenced by the activity of the senses or impulses. Both these are of the animal order, and it is the aim of intelligent activity to be sovereign over them, and never yield them the mastery, and rightly so, as it is the very nature of intelligence to put all these things to its own use. The third element <clears throat> in a rational constitution is a judgment unhurried and undeceived. So that's one thing that has to have, at, at, let's say, a renaissance in the, in, um, uh, when it comes to the philosophy of law, where it has to have the principles of being unhurried and undeceived. So let your directing mind hold fast to these principles and follow the straight road ahead. Then it has what belongs to it. Imagine you were now dead or had not lived before this moment. Now view the rest of your life as a bonus and live it as nature directs. That means see life as a blessing and listen to the mystery of the universe as it's happening. Learn from your living moment. Love only what falls your way and is fated for you. What could suit you more than that? In every contingency, keep in your mind's eyes those who had the same experience before and reacted with vexation and disbelief or complaint. So where are they now? Nowhere. Well then, do, what, do, do you want to act like them? Why not leave the moods and shift, uh, shifts of others to the shifting and the shifted, and for yourself concentrate wholly on how to make use of these contingencies? You will then use them well, and they will be raw material in your hands. Only take care and seek your own best good in all that you do. Remember these two things. The action is important. The context is different. <clears throat> Dig inside yourself. Inside there's a spring of goodness ready to gush at any moment if you keep digging. The body too should stay firmly composed and not fling itself about either in motion or at rest. Just as the mind displays qualities in the face, keeping it intelligent and attractive, something similar should be required of the whole body. But all this should be secured without making an obvious point of it. The art of living is more like wrestling than dancing, uh, in that it stands ready for what comes and is not thrown by the unforeseen. All the time you should consider who are these people whose endorsement you wish, and what are the minds that direct them. When you look into the sources of their judgment and impulse, you will not blame their unwitting error, nor will you feel the need of their endorsement. No soul, says Plato, likes to be robbed of truth. <clears throat> and the same holds of justice, moderation, kindness, and all such virtues. Essential that you should keep this constantly in your mind. This will make you more gentle to all. Yeah, moderation. 
I mean, it depends. The context of modern, it compared to, I have this feeling that everything we do right now to advance civilization is going to be nothing compared to how advanced civilization can be. So it's never enough, believe it or not. That means the concept of enough doesn't exist <coughs> for an infinite being, you know, which is the human narrative, <coughs> human character. So, and the same holds of justice, moderation, kindness, and all such virtues. Essential that you should keep this constantly in your mind that will make you more gentle to all. Whenever you suffer pain, have ready to hand the thought uh, that pain is not a moral evil and does not harm your go governing intelligence. Pain can do, can do no damage either to its rationale, either to... Oh my God. Pain can... <laughs> Pain can do no damage either to its rational or to its social nature. In most cases of pain, you should be helped uh, too by the saying of Epicurus. Pain is neither unendurable nor unending as long as you remember its limits and do not exaggerate it in your imagination. That means there's an exa exaggerated re uh, pain and that means the cultural identification with what is going on with you, which is a panic re response to that landscape. And then there's the actuality of what is going on in, 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 the, in the outer realms on a purely physical, material level, you know. <clears throat> uh, the, the outer realms, um, uh, the film projector requires this, is, you know, how, the, you know what I mean. And I guess I'll end it at the last sentence. Remember, too, that many things we find disagreeable are the unrecognized analogs of pain. Drowsiness, for example. Oppressive heat. Loss of appetite. <clears throat> so when you find yourself complaining of any of these, say to yourself, you're giving, you're giving in to pain. So when someone complains, the pain is winning somehow. So, or the inefficiency of the resistance or the something something's happening that they it's like because if the person feels their eyes deserve a better life those eyes cannot fear because their attention is not on that image first fear will be in the passenger seat rather than the driver's seat I don't know what he means by this, but he says, take care that you never treat the misanthropic as they treat mankind. <sighs> what does this mean? I think I have a clue for the... Disliking humankind and avoiding human society. Yeah, yeah, we don't treat them... Uh, no, no, wait. He said, take care that never treat the missing drug as they treat mankind. Oh, yeah, yeah. That means if somebody is being cruel to society, you can't show kindness because their cruelty is from their inner realm only. But it doesn't mean you, you show the opposite of kindness. You observe or find a way to bring them out of their inner realm. I don't know what else to do with that. <laughs> And um, last but not me, least, um, Marcus Aurelius says, Perfection of character is this, to live each day as if it were your last, without frenzy, without apathy, without pretense. The gods who are free from death do not resent their need throughout all the length of eternity to tolerate in such, such numbers such worthless creatures as men. What is more, they even care for them in all sorts of ways. And do you, with the merest time before your own exit, refuse to make the effort and that when you are one of the worthless creatures yourself, it is ridiculous not to escape from one's own vices, which is possible while trying to escape the vices of others, which is impossible. Whatever the rational and social faculty finds, neither intelligent nor to the common good, it, 
Oh my god. Whatever the rational and social faculty finds neither intelligent nor to the common good it judges with good reason beneath itself. <sighs> Going too fast. Whatever the rational and social faculty finds neither intelligent nor to the common good it judges with good reason beneath itself. When you have done good and another has benefited, why do you still look as fools do? For a third thing, for a third thing besides credit for good works or a return. No one, try, no one tires of receiving benefit, and action in accordance with nature is your own benefit. Do not then tire of benefit gained by benefit given. The nature of the whole set its, uh, the whole set its, the nature of the whole set, oh my god, listen to this. The nature of the whole, with capital W, set itself to create a universe. So now, either everything that comes into being springs from that as logical consequence, or else even the primary aims to which the directing mind of the universe sets its own impulse. Oh my god. So now... <laughs> Uh, so now either everything that comes into being springs from that as logical consequence or else even the primary aims to which the directing mind of the universe sets its own impulse are irrational. Reminding yourself of this will help you to face much with great, greater tranquility. So the whole universe set itself to create itself. So we are like the universe's artwork. So Marcus Aurelius says, so now either everything that comes into being springs from that as a logical consequence. That means everything's coming from one, one, you know, so, uh, a collective source. We feel our source is individual, but here saying collective. So, or else even the primary aims to which the directing mind of the universe sets its own impulse are irrational. <clears throat> that means if the whole universe isn't doing what uh, isn't the mo isn't present as the movement uh, simultaneously as we are, that means it's as if we are in the imagination of greater dimension, of of a greater truth, the living mystery in the mind of the beyond. This was a long episode. Uh, anyone, everyone who endured through this, thank you. And um, there's so much to the world that we don't know yet, and that should be enough to endlessly explore as an ultimate mission of our species. We are explorers. Uh, in the greatest void we have ever known, in the fog of language. Now the time has come where Mr. Ruthen is saying we must build the, the great airport, which is this idea of the advanced civilization. Because ultimately the evolution of a sky city, it goes to a point where it becomes an interstellar city that's like the, there's stages in between I've shared in other talks or something new I haven't shared before in any talk is that I thought about it as caterpillar sky cities so one giant sky city is pulling other sky cities connected to it and it's literally like we have built dragon cities you know imagine something like that where it's like one sky city giant sky city is lifting all the other sky cities connected to it with this in, in, impenetrable kind of rope which is like a giant giant tunnel you know where people are living in uh, like everywhere you know dimensions are orchestrated gravity technology is administered properly so the most efficient use of the city you know and air purification that's going to be a complex thing That means aside from plant life, there, sh there should probably be some sort of giant bubbles of oxygen, like uh, oxygen bubbles we're sending beyond our uh, uh, giant oxygen spheres, balloons, like we're sending above our atmosphere to grab it in, in for the sky city backup or something. I don't know. So, some idea in those lines. But <laughs>
but anyways thanks for listening and uh rise mankind rise